Good morning, dear students. My name is Farhan Mazar. Today, the subject we are studying is physics 5054. This is Cambridge O-Levels Physics. Today, we have set our hearts to solve uh, paper four. We call it alternative to practical. This is called ATP paper. Today, we have selected May, June 2012 for two paper. So let's start this paper. So my dear students on your screen, May, June 2012, four two paper. This is uh, uh, physics uh, paper, paper four, time allowed is one hour. So let's start this paper. The first question coming up on your screen is, a student investigates the cooling of water. Some of the apparatus is set up as shown in the figure 1.1. <clears throat> so here we have a stopwatch, here we have a beaker in which we have water. This is placed on a bench and here we have a stirrer. A volume of 100 centimeter cube of boiling water is poured into the beaker. The student starts the stop clock when the temperature of the water is 90 degrees centigrade. The, time, the water is allowed to cool and its temperature theta is recorded every two minutes. On the figure 1.1, draw the thermometer in the most suitable position for measuring the temperature of the water as it cools. So here you have to draw a thermometer. Remember, the bottom of the thermometer should not touch the beaker. So let me show you, here we go. So you can see I have drawn that diagram. So here is that diagram, I have drawn it. This is a thermometer. Its bulb should, should be in the water and it should not touch the walls or the bottom of the beaker. So thermometer drawn with the bulb in the center of the liquid, that's the marking scheme. Okay, so the next thing they are asking is suggest a reason why the thermometer should be held in a clamp so that you can hold the thermometer steady or you can keep the thermometer in the middle of the water in the beaker and, uh, and the thermometer should not be, I mean, shaking or moving. So these are the answers. Okay, so... My answer here is uh, it will keep the thermometer in desired position and it will be steady. The thermometer will be steady and it will not touch the bottom if you want. Sported in the center of the water, not touching the beaker, no need to hold it. Hold scale facing you. This is the marking scheme. Okay. He said, describe how the student avoid Pallack's error when reading the thermometer. You see, if you want to um, avoid the parallax error, uh, the line of sight must be perpendicular to the scale from where you will be taking the reading. So that's my suggestion. Uh, here is the written answer. His line of sight should be perpendicular to the scale of thermometer. I just forgot to write the full. Here, this word is thermometer, okay? So the line of sight, view, eye level, perpendicular to the scale, allow answers on the figure for 1.1. Okay. The next question is, uh, the student, the stop clock measures to the nearest second. Suggest why in this experiment, the student does not need to use a digital uh, stopwatch measuring to 0 0.01 second. You see, uh, this much accuracy in the time 0 0.01 second is not required in this experiment. We are checking that how the cooling of the thermometer, how the cooling of the water will take place. And so we can do it with the, and after every one minute, suppose I'm taking or noting down the temperature, so I don't need that 0 0.01 second accurate time. That is not required. So uh, 
he does not require to note temperature after every 0.01 second. He notes temperature after every two minutes. So in the experiment, he's noting down the temperature after every two minutes. So he don't need 0.01 second. He he's only need after every two minutes, he's noting down the temperature. <clears throat> So the answer is only timing every 22 minutes, time measured in minutes, reading to the nearest second, temperature changes slowly, long time to cool. That precision is that precision not required, clock accurate enough, does not need 0 0.01 second. So if you are taking the reading after every two minutes, you, don't, you do not need a clock which is accurate up to 0 0.01 second. Then uh, their question is, uh, explain why the student places the stop clock close to the beaker so that uh, he can he can uh, watch the thermometer and the stop uh, clock at the same time. So both of them should be in his uh, view uh, so that he can observe both stopwatch and thermometer together. That's our answer. Can see, read, notice thermometer and timer together, can measure the temperature and time more accurately or quickly. So our answer is right. Okay. The student records his results in a table. Figure 1.2 shows the student's results. So when the time is zero, the temperature is 90. When the time is two minutes, the temperature drops to 76. When the time is four minutes, the temperature drops to 69. When the time is six minutes, the temperature is 65. When the time is eight minutes, the, the temperature is 61. When the time is 10 minutes, the temperature is 58. When the time is 12 minutes, the temperature is 55. On the figure 1.3, plot the graph of the theta degree centigrade on the y-axis against the t in minutes on the x-axis. Start your graph from theta 40 degree centigrade and time zero. So this is the graph, uh, figure 1.3 is a four mark question. Here on the x-axis, we will have time. The time is in minutes. And on the y-axis, we have temperature and the temperature is starting from 40, not from zero. So uh, I will plot this. This is the table which I need to plot, okay? So, uh, Sorry, 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 sorry. This is the uh, table on whose basis I'm going to make the graph. So the time is changing from, okay, so here we go. So on the x-axis, I will write uh, 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12. Here we have the time and that is in minutes. So this is the labeling of the x-axis. On the y-axis, you see, we will have, uh, on the y-axis, we have, uh, I mean, the temperature here, which is starting from 40. So that's 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100. Two centimeters representing 50, uh, sorry, 10 uh, degrees centigrade. So here I have the temperature. And this is called a labeling, and it's very important. This quantity, you name the write the name of the quantity, and you also write the unit in which you are going to do this. Okay, so now I will plot this graph. Uh, at zero, you will have 90. At zero, we will have 90. And at two, you have 76. At two, we will have 76. This is the dot. And at four, we will have 69. At four, you will have 69. This is the dot. And at six, you have 65. At six, you will have 65. This is the dot. And at eight, you have 61. So at eight, we will have 61. So you put a dot here. And at 10, you have 58 temperature. At 10, the 58 is the temperature. And at 12, the temperature is 55. At the 12, the temperature is 55. So put the dot here. Then join them with a smooth curve. Okay, so that's what they are asking us. He said, draw a curve line of the best fit. Okay, so we have drawn, uh, this is a, a line of the curve of the best fit. So once you have done this, then their question is, 
explain why the temperature of the water does not fall to zero degrees centigrade. You see, the um, the the temperature of the water, the water is cooling down. The temperature of the water will obviously go down, but it will not go to the zero degree centigrade because the water will cool only to the room temperature and the room temperature is not zero degree centigrade. It's more than zero degree centigrade. So that, that's what we think. At the room temperature, the water will be at thermal equilibrium with the surrounding. So when the water will be in the thermal equilibrium with the surrounding, its temperature will not further drop. Or in simple words, you can say when the temperature of the water will reach the, uh, the temperature of the room or the surrounding, then it will not further drop because it becomes in therm thermal equilibrium with the with the surrounding. So uh, here uh, you see these are the marking scheme points for the C first part. Cannot fall below, only falls to room temperature, temperature of the surrounding. Okay, the next question they are asking us is, uh, use your graph to, I mean, uh, use your graph to determine the time taken for the temperature of the water to fall from 90 to 80. So from graph, I have to tell, from 90 to 80. So this is 90, the time is zero. When the temperature is 80, the time is 1.6 minutes. I think 1.6 minutes. The time is 1.6 minutes. Let, let's check. The time will be, <clears throat> he's saying 1.2 to 1.4. And because uh, you see, I just skipped these two points. That's why it's giving you uh, 1.6. So if, if you have gone from here, then it will be 1.6. Okay. So, our answer is 1.6. They are saying 1.2 to 1.4. So because they skipped these two points, that's why this problem is coming. So don't skip them. So 1.6 um, is approximately right. But if you make a better line of uh, curve of the best fit, then it will be 1.4. It will come in that range. Okay, so... Uh, <clears throat> The experiment is repeated with the same volume of water in a wider beaker as shown in the figure 1.4. Okay, now uh, here is the original uh, beaker. Here we have a wider beaker. State and explain the fact of using the wider beaker on the time taken for the temperature of the water to fall from 90 to 80 degrees centigrade. You see, uh, in it's a two marks question. In the case of an, a wider beaker, the surface area of the beaker of the water surface will become uh, larger. The surface area of the water will be larger. So the rate of evaporation uh, of the water from that beaker will be faster. So um, it means that it will uh, more quickly, it will lose the um, heat. So the temperature drop in the wider beaker will be faster. So the temperature uh, from 90, uh, it will drop from 90 to 80 in, in less time. That's what I think. Okay, so uh, here is the written answer. So let's see. Uh, in... In wider beaker, temperature will drop from 90 to 80 degrees centigrade in less than 1.6 minutes. Because the marking scheme says 1.4 minutes. But you can say 1.6 minutes because my answer is 1.6 minutes. So in wider beaker, the temperature will drop from 90 to 80 degrees centigrade in less than 1.6 minutes. In a wider beaker, surface area of the water is larger. So the heat loss due to evaporation is more in the wider beaker. So that's our logic. So let's check the marking scheme. He says the time decreases, time uh, temperature falls, cools more quickly. Heat loss more quickly from larger area, evaporates more quickly from the larger area. So this is a 13 marks question. That was the question number one. And I can tell you one very important thing here. 
So when I draw this line or the curve of the best fit, I miss these two points and the both of them remain below my line of best and uh, my curve of best fit. So this should have gone from here. You see, this point and this point should have been skipped. I should have joined this point and then join, join this point with this point. Okay. So that the same number of points above and below the line should be there. So you can draw better. I think a little, it should go little down this line and the curve of best fit. The rest of the thing is good. Okay, now we are going to the next question. He says, uh, that is the question number two. He says that uh, a student uses a pendulum to obtain a value for the acceleration of free fall G. Figure 2.1 shows the pendulum hanging from a fixed support. Okay. So here we have a support, here's the string, here we have the pendulum bob. The length L of the pendulum is measured from the support to the center of the mass of the bob. On the figure 2.1, mark and label the length L of the pendulum. Okay, so the length of the pendulum is from this support point to the center of this uh, sphere. And that is called the length of the length of the pendulum. So on the figure 2.1 mark, okay, so we will mark that. There's no problem. Okay, so we are going to that question. Okay, so here you can see the center. Here I have drawn this line and, and this is the support. Uh, so the distance between them, I will mark it as L. That is what they are asking. So, uh, we are done with this question. Okay. The next question they are asking is, okay, so we are done with this. Okay. Describe a method to measure L accurately. So, how you can measure this L accurately? So, So uh, what I can do, I can measure the diameter of that bob with the help of a vernier caliper. And I will divide the diameter with the two. I will get the radius, then find the length of the string uh, from the support to the bob surface and add the uh, radius of that uh, bob into the length of the string. So that is how you will get this. So measure the length of the string from the support to the bob with the vertical scale and set square. Measure diameter of the bob by a vernier. Calculate the radius, add radius and length of the string. So that will give you the length of the pendulum. He says the uh, measuring instrument stated an additional detail how it is used. For example, add one by two measure diameter bob mark string at the correct length and measure from support to top and bottom of the bob when average vertical rule and set square described or drawn. So with the help of the set squares, you have to find out. I have not drawn it. So with the help of the set scale, you will measure this and the scale. You will measure this length of the string. And with the help of the vernier caliper, you will measure the diameter. And then divide the diameter with the two. So we are done with the second part. Now we are going to the B part. Three measurements are taken uh, of the time for 20 complete swings of the pendulum. Explain how to find the average time T for one complete swings. So um, add the time for 20 swings and you have done it three times So add the time taken for the first 20 swings, then the time taken for the second 20 swings, 
swings and then the time taken for the third time for the 20 swings. So add both these, uh, th all these three times. And when you get the total of the time, then divide it with the 60 because there will be total 60 swings. You will get the time for one swing. That is, uh, I think, my strategy. Divide the total time of 60 swings by 60 to calculate the capital T time for one swing. So that's how I think uh, it should be done. So the total time is the sum of the times divided by 60 is plain correct equation. Okay. So we are done. Okay. Now the question is, the value obtained for, for L is 0 0.50 meter and for capital T is 1.33 seconds. Using the relationship G is equals to 4 pi square L divided by T square, calculate the value of for the G. Uh, give your answer three significant figures. Okay. So here the L uh, is the length of the parallel and that is, uh, I have marked here. That's the length of the parallel. Okay. And T is the time for one swing. So just put these values here and you will be able to find out the value of the G. So let me show you. So I will put the values here, 4 pi uh, square and L is 0 0.50 meter. And the time is for the uh, one swing will 1.33 uh, whole square. You just enter these values in your calculator. You will write 4 multiply pi raised to power 2 multiply 0 0.450 divided by 1.33 square. And you will get 10.04. So approximately it is 10.0. So that's the value of the G. The formula is given. You only have to put the values. This is the right answer. Okay. Uh, then the question is calculate the value of the G. Okay, so we are done with that. We have calculated the value of the G, that is 10. He says, suggest an improvement to this experiment. How you can improve this experiment? Um, you see, you can you can take different lengths of the pendulum and from different lengths of the pendulum, again, again and again, find the value of the G. Every time change the value of the L and find the value of the G. And at the end, whatever the value of the G, let's say you have done this experiment three times, four times, take the average of those, uh, the values of the Gs. So use different lengths of the pendulum and find the value of the G, take average value of the G. So this is this will make your experiment more accurate. So repeat for different values of the length and average. Okay, so that's right. Okay, the next question is a student connects a cell, a switch and three resistors to make a circuit. The resistors are labeled A, B and C. The resistor A and B, the cell and the switch are all in series. Resistor C is parallel with the cell. In the space below, draw the circuit diagram. So here we have a space. So basically, it's a two marks question. So let me show you. I have tried to draw the scale. Uh, okay. So here we have... Uh, So they all are in uh, A, B, and the cell, and the switch. They all are in series. So you can see they are in series. And the C is parallel to the cell. So it's like this. OK? So this, this, they are cell, OK? They should be joined together like this. On your circuit diagram, draw the symbol for a voltmeter connected to measure the voltage across the resistor A. 
So parallel to the resistor A, I will draw a voltmeter here. Okay. Student X connects the circuit shown in the figure 3.1. X, Y, and Z. X, Y, and Z are three identical lamps. Okay. The student closes the switch. Lamp Z lights dimly. Lamp X and Y do not light up. Do not light. Take two of the followings, which are possible explanation. So, um, why uh, these two, uh, they will not light up while the Z is showing a dim light. So, they cannot be faulty. They both are not faulty. Only lamp Y, X is faulty. No, the only the lamp Y is faulty. That's right. That's not right. Uh, the cell is running down. Now, that can be the reason because it's not able to lit up all the cells. That can be the reason the cell is running down. And a connecting lead from the cell is broken. No, if this will happen, the current uh, will stop flowing. Uh, for example, through one branch, then the other one will... They are dimly light up. They have uh, the lights are dim, okay. Uh, the Z is dim and the X and Y do not light, okay. A connecting lead from the cell is broken. No, the current in the lamp X and the lamp Y is too small. That can be a good answer because the current is flowing through them, but they are not uh, they, they are not giving out light. The reason is because uh, the current flowing through them is very small. So we have uh, put a stick here and the tick here. Okay, so let's check. The cell is running down and the current in the X, lamp X and the lamp Y, they are just too short. It's too small, I mean. Let me read this question again. The student closes the switch. The lamp Z dimly uh, lights dimly. The lamp X and Y do not light. Tick two of, okay. The next question is, a student finds an old magnet at the back of a drawer containing other magnets. He designed an experiment to find out if it is still magnetized. He brings a plotting compass near to the end A of the old magnet as shown in the figure uh, 4.1. State the polarity of the end A of the old man because this um, plotting compass is pointing towards A. So this is definitely South Pole. So I think that the A is the South Pole because the magnetic compass is pointing towards it. Because the magnetic compass always points to the South. And because the magnetic compass always align itself with the magnetic lines. And wherever the magnetic line or the magnetic field will be, wherever the magnetic lines are going, the magnetic compass will point in that direction. So magnetic lines always goes to the south pole. So that's why the magnetic compass is pointing towards A. So the A is south pole, I think. So our idea is that the A is the south pole. Okay. The plotting compass is then brought near to end B as shown in the figure 4.2. The Here again, uh, because uh, the plotting compass is pointing towards the B, it means the B is the south pole. So my answer is also south pole. Same as A first part, I mean South Pole. Then he says, suggest a possible explanation for the student's results. You see, both the ends of the magnet cannot be the South Pole. So it means that uh, that magnet is not magnetized. It has lost its magnetism. It has lost its magnetism. Now it is only a bar of steel or iron. That is our answer. 
Bar not magnetized, soft iron, compass induces magnetism in the bar, north pole in the center of the bar, no keepers or magnet in the drawer. So that's why it has lost its electron, its magnetism, because there were no keepers. Keepers are used to, when you store a magnetic magnet bar, you put keepers around it, so it, it do not lose its magnetism. Okay. Describe how the student can use the plotting compass to plot the shape of magnetic field around a new magnet. You may use a diagram in your explanation. So what we do, we take a new magnet, we put it on a paper, and we mark the boundary of the magnet around uh, on the paper with the help of the pencil. And then we take our magnetic compass, we put it near the North Pole, wherever the pointer points. I put two dots on the paper coinciding with the, uh, the back and the front of the uh, that pointer. Then I pick up my magnetic compass. I put uh, my magnetic compass beyond the, my second dot in such a way that the tail of the pointer of the magnetic compass coincides with the uh, that second dot. And wherever the pointer will point, I will put a dot on the paper. Then I will continue doing this process until I have reached the other end of that uh, bar magnet. So uh, then I will join those dots with a curve and that will be a magnetic line starting from one pole going to the other pole. And then you can start, uh, put the magnetic compass on a different location near the North Pole and repeat the procedure again. So this is a diagram which you have to draw. This, these are representing magnetic compass. This is the bar magnet. So he says, put the bar magnet on a paper, mark its boundary, put compass, Near North Pole, put dots on the paper coinciding with the pointer's tail and head. Move the compass such that the tail coincides with the dot of, of the head. Continue until the South Pole is reached. Join the dots with a curve. Again, put compass on a different location near the North and repeat the same procedure. So this is, uh, this is my answer. So you can see it on the whole screen. And so let me show you the, uh, what we call it, marking scheme. So so uh, marks may be, okay, so here is the marking scheme. Uh, compass near the magnet and mark end of the plotting compass. Uh, Point to the first mark, mark another end along one field line, continue to the other pole or edge of the paper, or join dots to give the line or repeat to produce more field lines. Okay. So this is what, what the marking scheme is saying, and that's it. So, so that paper is almost over, only... Uh, when we have drawn this, okay, so remember, uh, we should have joined like this. I was uh, confused. I was not confused. I actually made it right, but I then I thought that my student can confuse because I have not completed the circuit. So that is question number three. Okay. So the rest of the thing is good. Okay. So, uh, Uh, my dear students, today uh, we have uh, today we have completed May June two thousand twelve uh, physics five zero five four four two paper. This was a paper four and an ATP paper, and this paper uh, four belongs from the uh, zone two or the variant two. 
Uh, my name is Farhan Mazar, and in this video, we have the solution of this paper. I have tried my best to explain you the concepts of this ATP paper. I think um, I've tried my best, and I hope you will understand uh, from this video how to solve this paper. And because with the paper, we are also using the marking scheme, and I hope you can do a better job on this paper. So uh, if you find this video useful and interesting for you, please share the link of this video onto your Facebook account, onto your Twitter account, and onto your Instagram. Also like this video. If you have any comment, please make that comment. And if you have not subscribed my channel, please, please subscribe my channel. And I, I put the end screen and I also put the cards on my video. And uh, please uh, check them also. So it's a great blessing for me that I can make these videos and touch so many lives of the students around the globe. Thank you very much for watching my video. God bless you all.